Now, at this point, I'm going to assume everybody has the bomb lab copied over to their their desktop somewhere and are able to open it up in Ida. Okay. So, let's go ahead and just in the case that for some reason you uh, you're you're welcome to keep Ida open if you're already on on the main function where you first came into Ida, uh, but uh, for those of you that aren't, let's go ahead and open up Ida again, accept the agreement. And once again, uh, so Chris, we're going to hit go after we open up Ida. So accept the agreement, hit go, and we'll have, we'll have Ida open up, drag a file here to disassemble. And let's make it so that we can actually see the bomb.exe in our background somewhere. I'm actually going to do it from a folder because I want to show you something. So I'm going to drag bomb.exe into this blank space here. And we're going to have, have a load a new file dialog box, hit OK. Say yes that we want to show uh, want, we want to use symbols. Okay, so we've got it loaded. Now you'll see Ida actually creates these four different files, all with the same root name of the file minus the .exe, and and then we've got a bunch of random extensions. So this is a the unpacked Ida database. Okay, it's broken up into four files. Now once you once you actually save the database, so we click File, Save. See, we now have a bomb.idb. Okay, that is a a packaged up, compressed copy of your database. Uh, when you when you quit, generally Ida will clean up these other files for you, other than the IDB. And that IDB file is the one that you can pass around to your fellow analysts. Uh, anybody else that you want to see what uh, that, that you want to share this information with. <coughs> so now, Ida gives you all these buttons at the top, and personally, I like to get rid of all that stuff. It's just taking up lots of space. Uh, I use a lot of the shortcuts, uh, and even if you don't want to use the shortcuts, there, there are always the menus to to get to all of these different items that are that are displayed here. Um, so you can see you get a little tooltip if you hover over these things, what they do. Um, and as we go along, I can explain what what each of these icons does, but. Uh, if for some reason you wanted to go ahead and remove some of this stuff, I would highly recommend that you don't remove navigation. So navigation, it, you can see I've lost a bar up at the top here, um, just underneath my cursor. Uh, if I show it again. Um, so I did this all by right clicking on the toolbar, just anywhere in the toolbar, it will give you this, this list of all the menus. Um, so this navigation bar, um, it's basically showing us a layout of the file. And this dark blue code, or this dark blue section right here, that is where you're going to spend a lot of your time. That is where uh, normal functions are going to be located, regular functions. Um, so the, the, I just identified code here, but it is, it's not something we have a signature for. It's not important. Um, we've got data sections here. Um, so if we click into the, this kind of green, brown color here, uh, you'll see there's all sorts of random bytes. Our data is generally uh, uh, 
generally read-only data. Uh, it's going to be where constants are stored. Uh, we've got these gray sections here. Um, and so we've got some sort of alignments here uh, and strings defined. see if you just click around in here, it will just take you to different parts of the assembly. So um, it's handy to have that available. So I'm going to try to make as much use of the space here. Um, this information down here, uh, this will give you a lot of information feedback from plugins. Um, it's telling, telling us uh, what version of clerk signatures it's using. Um, so it usually displays information when you're loading, uh, when some sort of error occurs. If you're trying to define something that doesn't work, uh, look down there and see, you know, are there any messages that is it explaining to you why, why things didn't work. You get a key that doesn't do anything. Um, there might be information down there. Uh, also, when you're debugging, you'll get a lot of information in there, it'll tell you hit a breakpoint. Uh, depending on what options you have uh, selected, you, you can get various different pieces of information. That's something that we can talk about tomorrow. Okay, but is everybody on this the sub four zero one one nine zero? Okay, so this is one of the troubles of, of navigating with, with this, this bar up here, okay? Um, when you do that, you can't just hit escape to go back, okay? So that is where our G key is handy, all right? So We've got this function underscore main. This is where I want you to be, but hopefully you're, you're, you've clicked in, in the navigation bar. And if you haven't already, just click in the navigation bar anywhere randomly. Hit the G key and type underscore main. That'll take you back to the main function. So. Now we've, uh, if, if for any reason you, you want to come back to this main function, you can go ahead and type it by its name. Um, and this is one reason why you want to go ahead and name functions when you, when you come across them and you've got some idea. Uh, you, if you need a temporary placeholder name, give it, you know, working function or whatever you want to call it. But the way you do that, you click on the node, uh, the, the, uh, the head node, so the very first node in the function, somewhere in the blank space above your stack parameters here. So stack parameters, uh, for those of you that weren't here earlier, are these items in green just above the code. So click in the space above there, hit N. So your, your M key will bring up this rename address. And then I want to get rid of the underscore, so I'll just call it me. Hit enter. And now anytime I want to come back to this, I'll just hit the G key and type in me. Hit enter, and it'll bring me right back here. Okay. So, Right now, I'm zoomed really, really closely in, and this isn't really telling me a whole lot. Um, it's what we've got here. You've got this sequence of instructions that you're going to become very familiar with if you continue to do this sort of work. Push EVP, move. That that basically is setting up the base pointer, so it's saying this is where this function stack begins. Um, 
So base pointer stores where the function function stack begins, and then from there uh, we we are free to uh, move around the ESP. So basically, save PVP, save ESP, and go ahead and, and do our work. So and on top of this, so this is called a prolog. And what you might also see are these push instructions immediately following push EVP, move EVP, ESP. These are saving registers. And you'll see at the end of the function, there are corresponding pop instructions. Um, so, Apparently, we weren't really that interested in saving EV, uh, ECX because we're not restoring it at the end. But EVP, we do want to get back. So at the end of the function, we've got this pop which corresponds to the push up above. So, as I mentioned, there are six phases to the bottom lab. I am going to walk through the first one, and, and you won't have to figure this one out on your own. And then we'll move on to you guys digging in and trying to solve, the, solve these problems. Um, I'll go over a little bit about what that phase is, what you're going to face during that phase, and then you're going to try to sort out the answer. Um, so what is the bottom lab? I keep talking about this, and I haven't actually demonstrated to you. So When we first want to understand something about a program, uh, hopefully we have the ability to execute it now. There might be situations where you don't want to actually execute the code because you really have no idea what it does, and you don't want it to break a computer, and install some sort of uh, malware that you can't get out of the system, um, or maybe it's a buggy application that you're trying to work with and in your operating system it will break things. So uh, you may may not want to execute it, but if you can, um, get as much out of that as you can. So this is, it's much better for us to execute this from the command line because if we just launch it, then when it quits, it's just going to go away, and we're not going to see what its outputs are. So uh, if you hit the window key and type CMD, open up a command prompt, so CMD, and if you can, so we should be in users student. Um, did anybody not put the bomb lab on their desktop or or in a folder on their desktop? Okay. So we need to change to that directory. So type cd desktop. So if you type de, hit tab, you'll get the word desktop. You want a, a backslash and whatever directory. So if it's directly on the desktop, that's fine. Just hit enter. Otherwise, type in the name of the folder. For my, my case, I have desktop slash re. And type bomb.exe once you're in that directory. And we get a message, and it hasn't quit the application yet. So what's happening? It's waiting for input. So there's some function that's just sitting here idling, waiting for us to, to put in something. So first thing we know about this application, what, what do we know we'll find in the disassembly? We're going to find a get string or get or whatever the equivalent of those. Right. But before that, what are we going to find? A string. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Uh, so some sort of print function. All right, so we're going to see called to printf. So 
So to work backwards here, we're, we're looking for some calls to some sort of get us or some sort of input function. Uh, we're looking for this output of have a nice day. So if you don't know which input function they're using, maybe the best thing to do is look for have a nice day or welcome to my fiendish little bomb. Um, so we will get into that in, in Ida in a second. But um, so let's give it some input. Hit enter, and we get another message. So this is what we're trying to avoid right here. We're trying to avoid this message. So that's something else that we might want to look into. Where is the where are we getting this boom message? All right. So sometimes you can you have a lot of these different things that you're looking for suggest that maybe you write down what these strings are uh, and then later on you can you know what you're uh, what you're going to be looking for so what we're going to be doing is we're going to be trying to use some of those features that I talked about before the highlighting we're going to utilize the graph view to try to navigate to to these different strings that we, we just talked about. Um, we're going to talk about reason of analysis. So um, we want to know uh, where these things are used. So if we give names to the, these various different functions and, uh, and strings that we come across, then later on when we, when we come across them, then uh, we, we won't have to reanalyze them. So uh, using that, that n Pressing N, getting the rename address dialog box, that's going to really help us out a lot. Um, we're going to talk about imports, uh, how we can use those to short circuit the process and figure out what is going on. Typically, um, typically when, when you get into a function, one of the first things you want to look for is imports because that's going to really give you an indication of what the end goal of this is. Uh, it is, it's possible that somebody could write code to do, you know, handle their own uh, network stack and do all this work on their own. Chances are they're probably going to use the Windows APIs to do their, their, their dirty business. Uh, and you know, more, more times than not, you're going to be actually looking at a clean disassembly. And so you can make assumptions. Um, just remember that, you know, there might be some trickery involved. They might be trying to lead you down some straight path and say, oh, this thing writes files. You know, you, you know what this thing does. Or this just prints a message. But maybe there's something lying underneath. But very often you'll find that the, the API functions actually will be an indicator of what the function does. So we're also going to look at strings, and we're going to talk about how, how they're going to help us <coughs> get to the places we need to go. Or uh, maybe strings will tell us, uh, you know, we've got some sort of bot. Who does it communicate with? Well, that's where, where we're going to be looking at the string information. So we've executed it. And there's one other thing I wanted to show you. So. Say I run bomb.exe. Before I just gave it one input. Actually, I didn't give it anything on the command line. What if I give it a command line argument? Bomb.exe space hdf. Error couldn't open asdf. So what's going on here? Try to open a file. Try to or it is intensely misleading error message. Or exactly, exactly. So you can, uh, yeah, you can certainly read into it and and be led astray. <clears throat> In this case, we actually have some sort of file input going on. I promise you. <laughs> now, if we write two different parameters, we actually see the usage. So assuming that. They're not trying to lie to us. Then we know that this thing takes one input file. So 
So just an interesting thought. You, uh, you might be, so I, I often reference malware analysis and that's because that is my, what my key use of, of, of reverse engineering is. Um, so you might, you might think, well, malware, that's not going to take command line inputs. Well, you'll find out that there are lots of things that, yes, they're just executed from uh, say, say they're just trying to load some exploit and get an application running. They don't necessarily pass command line parameters to it. But you might be surprised, so try it out. Try some different parameters and, and see what happens. Okay. So, we had our, our different messages here. Um, the bomb has blown up is one of the interesting ones to me because this is what I want to avoid. So how do I find this function that I never want it to get to? So I'm going to be looking for that string. All right. So if we look here, we've got, I just got a whole bunch of different tabs here. You're typically going to be in the item view, but we've also got the ability to look at everything in hex. And this is based on the, the current location uh, in, in your item view. They should be synced up. Um, we've got the exports here. This is, if this were some sort of library it, itself, if, if I actually load a library into IDA, this would show me different functions that, um, that you could call, say, like, um, we've got win32.dll. It's got a whole bunch of library functions. So you'll see, like, you know, create file and these sorts of things all listed in here. Uh, in our case, it's just got one export. That's the start function. Uh, pretty much every uh, every binary is going to have some sort of entry point, whether it's whether it's a, a Windows binary, whether it's a Unix binary. Um, if it's a if it's a library, it's going to be some sort of initialization code setting up some sort of constants. Um, imports. This is a little more interesting. We got a lot of a lot of items in here. Um, this is sorted by uh, library, and you can change the sort, of course. Um, yeah. If we want to see what calls library functions, is there a good way to do that? Like, if we wanted to know what functions in the program call, you know, sleep or set on handled exception filter or whatever, how do we do that? That's a good question. Well, let's just take a look at sleep here. So. Um, right clicking, and this doesn't help. Uh, <laughs> okay, so if we if we double click sleep, and I'm in the hex view, um, we come to this this item in the import table. All right, and you can see it says right here data xref t main crt yada yada. Okay, so if I right click here. Um, So click on sleep, right click, you'll see jump to xref to operate. So normally I just use the x key. Um, so once again, click on sleep, click x, press the yes x key, and you'll see we've got two references to sleep. So you could double click on one of these. I ask you not to do this now, but we'll, we'll be doing a lot of this later on. Um, you can click on one of these items and jump to it. Um, but this is where all these calls occur. So good question. Um, so we hit escape. And that's bringing me to T main CRT startup. So this didn't take me to where I wanted to. And this is, once again, where it's handy. So right. So when I type in the underscore, See, enter an invalid address. Um, so maybe you maybe you've forgotten what, how you name something. Um, if that's the case, then we've got this functions window here. So 
can go ahead and take a look at all the different functions and we can see, oh, I, I named it main, not underscore main. So this is handy um, if you quickly want to get to one of your functions and you've forgotten what you named it. Uh, once again, you can sort it. Um, so there's different information here about, uh, about each, each function. Uh, so we've got segment. Segment is the area of the executable. And the executable is broken up into various different segments, text, data. Um, there are segments that are only loaded when, when are only available when the application is loaded into memory. So when, when it's actually running. Um, now we've got uh, we've got start, length, and then a bunch of different um, different options for for these functions. So we'll come back to that later. And we've got our strings window here. I'm going to sort it by string. And if you just start typing, if you click on it, click in here and start typing, it tries to search for you. So I'm trying boom, and that doesn't work. So you see, because I saw boom in capital letters, I tried to search for that, but didn't find it. How about uh -huh. the bomb has blown up? I type that in and I found it. There's a new line. Exactly. So the, the reason I couldn't find boom is because of, because of this new line character. So um, that's that's kind of a, <laughs> kind of one of those annoying things. You where can do backslash on boom. Yeah. Right. Exactly. So so. You can actually type in an escape character if for some reason uh, there's like a null character or a new line in this case. And it will take us to that item. Um, but yeah, play, play around Ida. You know, there are a lot of things where you just, um, you, you can search it, um, especially in these names, functions, all these uh, imports, all these tabs, they allow you to search this way. So, and you'll see, I'll type something in. So, type something in that doesn't work, and I actually have to delete, hit the delete key to to clear the search. All right. So if you type in ASDF, doesn't come up with anything, then hit delete, and then it clears your search. You can start over. Okay, so back to the strings window here. So let's go ahead and find <coughs> the bomb has blown up. Everybody find that? Okay, so if we double click on that, we've got our, our string here in memory. It's in the data section. And we've got a definition of it, so it's saying it's a, a char array, it's given it this, this name, A, the bomb has blown up. So I want to rename this. So I'm going to click on this line, 404B1C, and I'm going to press the N key with that, that highlighted, so you'll see our context highlighting here. Whenever you got that, hit N. And I'm going to call this failure string. You can call it whatever you want to call it. Okay, so now wherever this is used, I'm going to see this, this failure string uh, name. So now we talked about the, the cross references. So with that still clicked, with that still highlighted, press the X key, and you'll see we've got one reference to this. So this is the only place it's used in the entire application, or maybe somehow it's it's used uh, um, through some sort of uh, maybe the address is calculated. But we'll just for now look at the one reference. So double click. 
and it will take us to this function here, 401960. So this is where we want to, I, I can assume that this is where we don't want to end up. We've got two columns to print up, printing boom, the bomb is blown up, and then we've got if exit. Now that's uh, imported exit function. It, it's just going to, this, this is going to be where the, the program terminates. So we can give this guy a name. So if you click on sub 401960 N and let's call this um, call it bomb underscore explode. So well, the question is where is this used? So if we press X, you can see there are lots of different places that, that this is used. So this is going to be probably not the best way to backtrack. Okay, because we've got so many different options. Um, where, where do you even begin? They, it could happen one of many different ways. So now where can we go? What, what's a place that we can, we can try to figure out where, where things went wrong? What can I look for? What happens right after have a nice day? Right, after have a nice day. So I backtracked. Backtracking didn't work. It didn't get me to, it, it just got me more confused. So let's go to our strings again. And have a nice day. Isn't there? We see halfway there. So how about this string right here? Welcome to my fiendish little bow. So that's the one of the strings we saw right here. Let's double click on that. And I'm gonna rename this guy. Once again, clicking on it, pressing N. Call that welcome string. Okay, and once again, I'm going to keep it selected, press X, make our window bigger here, and I'm going to go to this here. So double click it, or yeah, double click and now we've got another function. We're not in the main. Oh, we are in the main. How about that? Back to where we started. So we've got a couple print instructions here. And then we've got some function that looks like it's repeatedly called. So this is done after every prompt. So what do you think this does? The person with the answer, or what are supposed to put in? Input. So yeah, it's the it's it, it potentially the input function. That's just my guess. Um, so in this sort of situation, I give it a name something like input question mark. Okay, I'm not sure. Um, but it's reasonable to assume. Um, and then later on, if I verify this, I can rename it, remove the question mark, so I can say, okay, I've actually validated this. Okay. So we click on that input function. Zoom out here. Um, is everybody with me here? Any, any questions? Are we doing remote users? Are we good? Anybody not where we're at right now on the on this function that I call input question mark? Okay. Looking good. Good. All right. So one of the first things I generally do when I enter a function is I click on call. Because that will click, quickly show me where all these calls occur. So we've got all these calls here. 
Um, and first thing I'll look for is uh, any particular uh, API, any any library functions. So right here we've got string length function, string length, and we've got printf iob func. So some of these you'll recognize right up right away. Some of them maybe not so much. Um, we've got this braid bomb here, and uh, as you pointed out, so this is uh, this is actually um, so you can actually uh, use this application as a, a server application. You can talk to, uh, you can submit answers to a professor this way. Um, so um, this get env function actually is going to try to get this grade bomb environment variable. So you can take guesses as to what, what that's used for. Um, okay, so We've got, at the top here, we have this function that we don't know what it is. And then we've got a bunch, bunch of functions where we could look them up. So you can go ahead and Google around for these functions. Um, one second. Uh, but I will tell you that what this does, this IOB function, Chris, I'll get to you in a second. Uh, the purpose of that is to get the, uh, the standard standard out or standard in or standard error file handle. Okay, so that's something that what you expect to happen next is, is to have some uh, read from file function called or uh, some some function called where it's going to get the the output of this IOB function. Okay, go ahead, Chris. Can you? Uh, Get on your mic. No? Okay. We'll come back to it. Really? Uh, yeah, I got it. My mic. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Sure. I can oh, hear you. Okay. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out, you know the graphic you brought up? The what? The, okay, you've got a graphical representation right now. It's almost like a, it's almost like a map. It's got uh, green and red lines. That's correct. How how do I get to that? Right now, I'm in. Uh, I went to that instruction. I did G, and I've got this little graphical overview box at the bottom. Uh, mm -hmm. How do I get to the graphical representation you you have right now? Uh, well, if you click anywhere in the graph overview, it'll take you to that location in the in the disassembly window. Do you have the so everybody should have the Ida View A tab selected in Ida? Uh, Ida View. How do you select the Ida View A tab? Uh, so the, the big window. Ida View A. I've got it. Okay, okay. I'm there. I know. All right, great. Thank you. Sorry about that. I'm uh, going to click off my mic in a minute. Okay, so you can see here our, uh, our bomb explode function is actually called several times. Um, and that's right after some sort of messages error premature EOF on uh, STD in. So um, assuming that this isn't trying to mislead us, uh, it sounds like this, this is occurring because some failure in, in input and output, um, and this actually occurs. Uh, we've got this call to IOB func, which I told you gets the uh, gets the handle to standard out, and then we've got this call here. So, what is this call? So right now on sub four zero one eight one zero. Let's give that a name so we stop saying all these names, uh, all these numbers. Um, right now we see f get s in it, so I'm going to call it get underscore string question mark. And 
what we see is we got a loop. You can see that in our graph overview here. And we've got a bunch of calls and up get s. So at this point, I could go ahead and try to understand every little bit of this thing. Okay. And and spend spend extra time looking at this, but at some point you've got to decide is it worth diving deeper or not. We've we've made an assumption here. It it looks it calls out get us. It looks like it's getting some sort of a string uh, repeatedly. Um, so at this point we're going to stick with our assumption and and move on and know if at some point we we realize, well, we weren't right. We can always come back to this thing, and we can, we can navigate using our functions window to get back here. So let's step back. So hit the escape key if you if you did go into this get string function. Should be back at our input function, and get string moves. EAX into this bar 8. And we're comparing it with 0. If it continues on, then we're going we're gonna to actually check the, we're going to get the length of the string, supposedly. So, this, this could be a check to see whether we got a string back, uh, a, 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 so a string pointer, or it could be a, a matter of just some check. Maybe the function returns, yes, I got a string. No, I didn't get a string. So we, if we look ahead here, we see EAX gets some D word. So this right here, I double click on it. We see some address. It's got a question mark here. This is actually address space that is going to be available to us when the program's running. But right now, there's nothing in it. So this is something that's, that's going to be uh, allocated on the fly. So we've got another unknown. And that is, so we get this address, we put it into EAX. Then we get 50 multiply it by EAX. And then we get some offset added to EAX. Okay. So and then we're and then we're checking or then we're getting the String length of EAX. There's one push before the, str the string length call, and string length only takes one argument. It's a string. Um, so, is there anyone that has any idea what this D word and this unknown is? Well, where is it used? I'll start with this. Unknown x, and it's used within our get string function. Okay, and similarly, we're we're doing an addition on this location. So this for or C zero four some kind of data structure, and it's an offset into it. The unknown is an offset into it. It's it's a data structure. Okay, and and we're getting an offset into it. So we, we get this, this value, this D word here. It's put in the EAX, and then it's multiplied by 50. OK. And then we have this offset, and that value is added. And then this thing's used as a string pointer. So what we actually have here is an array of strings, OK? So which is also a data structure. Arrays are our data structures. Um, and so this this 50 here, this is 
actually going to be maybe the, the size of each string within the array. Um, and if you uh, click on, on this 50 and hit H, then we uh, th th that actually changes that value from hex to decimal. If you hit H again, we'll switch it back. Um, so that this is saying this this is some uh, well the, the value is 80. Uh, every every item in this array we can assume is 80 bytes. All right. So so if this is if this unknown is a string array, what is the D word 404 C04? That's multiplied by the size of the string. Okay, it's it's actually an index into our array. Okay? We we take our, our base of our array. Okay, draw this up on the board here. So this unknown 404 F80. Let's refer to that as base, uh, or uh, uh, string array. And this other thing, I'm going to call it counter. Okay. So we've got string array. It's pointing at something, so I, I entered ASDF. So in here, we actually take this counter value. Let's say it equals 1. I multiply it by, by 80. So we had that IML instruction. And then I add that to the base. So we've got one item in the in the array. So we've got this is the first item, this is the second one, this is the third. So the counter multiplied by 80 is going to tell us how far into this array that we're going to go. So, since we have multiple phases to this thing, this thing is deciding which one of these strings that we're actually currently currently getting. And you'll see that at the end of this function, counter is moved into ECX. So, there's only one time where counter's on the left side, okay? Items on the right side are, are the, the source is the source information. And the, informa the, the item on the left side of the comma is the destination. So there's only one time where we see counter as a destination. So right here we get move counter into ECX. We add one to ECX, and then ECX is moved into counter. So this is a very common increment step. Um, you might also see uh, uh, a uh, some, sometimes you'll see an instruction where we'll just add a single byte to a, a register before we iterate in a loop. Uh, that, that might also be a counter. So it doesn't always use a variable, but in this case we are using variables. Okay, so at this point we've got our input function. We know where that is. In the length and got error input line too long. We, not, we never did see that. So I'm going to run bob.exe and let's just say I type in over 80 characters. So hopefully I'm over 80 by now and 
Lo and behold, error input line too low. A string right here. So at this point, we know we're getting our, our input at this location here. And now we want to see how it's used. So let's jump to our main function. this input function call. We scroll down here, we see location 401085. See our, our, our welcome strings, we see input, and then we see some function, some function call, and I only see it once in here if I hit X. There's only one call to this. So, as this happens just before our phase one, phase one diffused, I, I'm, I'm going to take a guess here that this is our phase one, uh, our phase one test. Uh, there's a call right after it, and you'll see that that's actually executed over and over again. So once per step. So that could be some sort of a check. That maybe that maybe there's Maybe this prints out our output. So, or maybe it's it needs to do some sort of cleaning up the, the strings between every every execution. I don't know, but I'm interested in this function that's only called once. So, we see it takes one argument var var four which came from our input function. So EX moved into bar 4, and then that's moved into EDX. Quick Seems question. kind of wasteful. Um, yeah. So we, you know, we analyze the string and everything. So if you, hit, if you do control C, which can exit the program, it actually does the error premature yeah, EOF. But why does it never explode the bomb? Good question. So that's something I'm wondering. Hit Control C, and we actually don't see any output. You see, the, you get output that says, "Oh, premature EOF," but you never see the bomb explode. Is that boom? No, I never get. It never gets to boom. Okay. If you do Control C, it does not boom. I, I think that's a timing problem because I got boom one time. Yeah, I did get boom. But I didn't get the other message. I also didn't get the premature EOF every time. Yeah, it does not. Do, it does not boom after the after that. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, what what's going on there? Um, so, does that happen only when you when you hit Control C very quickly? So, let's say you delay every time. Okay. This this is a good question. I mean, behavior might be based on timing, right? So, let's just say I sit here and wait didn't do it. If you put in control Z, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it, it might be based on timing. Um, in this case, it's not. And I feel like we're hitting a, a distraction. Yeah. So this is one of these things where, where when you're looking at something, it's easy to go down these paths. Of, well, that's neat. Why is it doing that? But are you getting to the place you want to be? And that's the question you've got to ask yourself. So at some, in some situations, you want to know every little bit, every detail about a binary. Because you were either told that that's, that's what they need, or maybe you're trying to recreate it. Okay. In this case, we aren't trying to recreate it. So you've um, got to ask yourself, is it worth it? And for now, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to proceed on, but we can talk about that later. Okay. So I'm going to call this function here, this 401190. It's the first call after our first call to input. So you should see which uh, this which to blow yourself up. 
and we see printf, we see call to input, and then we see another call, it says 401190. Now, what I said before is my guess is that this is the phase one check, so I'm going to call it phase one question mark. And I'm going to double click on that to jump to it. I'll give you guys a second here so it keeps going still. Everybody with me here? Okay, Bill, just let me know if anybody uh, anybody's behind. Um, all right, so we've got another inter interesting string here. Uh, no, no idea why somebody would be starting to tell us about public speaking in here. That's kind of unusual. So we see that after our prologue, the push EVP movie, EVP ESP, got two pushes, a move in between them, and a call. Okay. So right here we are setting up an argument. We're, we're getting some some four byte value, just throwing it in the EAX, and then we're pushing that into the stack just before we call this function. Um, arg zero being our input, um, we didn't actually trace this back. Uh, we we don't really know what this input is, but we know this thing takes one argument. So. So if we come back to our call, so go back, uh, hit escape, should be back in the main function. Um, bar 4 was the, the output of EAX, or the output of, of the input function, and it's, uh, it came from EAX. So don't have to follow me along here, I'm just going to trace this back. Um, if I look to see what was stored in EAX, before we, we exited here, I see var c is eax. Okay, uh, this was when we were doing our, um, actually this looks like the addition that we did <coughs> before we checked the, the length of the string. And we have our string array, we have our counter, we're, we're getting to the proper offset within the string array. So EAX is actually going to end up with our input. So input string. So we know this thing. Uh, so go into phase one, and now we can call this first argument. Click on on the argument if you haven't named it my arg like I did. That should be arg0. Click on that. N. N key. And then we can call this input string. Okay. Now we've got our input string and uh, public speaking is easy. Pass to this guy here. Double click on this function. We can see we've got a loop. Something happens over and over again. We've got a couple calls. Questions over here? And that's a little bit lost. Okay. Um, if you are not with me, right now I am. So, do you know where the phase one function is? Yes. All phase one. Okay. And then you double click on the, the call. Yep. First. So you can see the bomb explode occurs here. This function returns some value in the EAX, and bomb explode occurs all right, um, if, if this condi condition isn't met here, this jump zero. So 
if so basically if EAX isn't zero coming back from this function here, then then it's gonna explode. So we want to figure out how to make this thing return one. That will take us into the bomb explode. And then how do we well, assuming it returns any any non-zero value. We we want this thing to return zero to be able to proceed past the bomb explode function. Alright, so let, let's just name everything as we go, because that way, that then you know we, we we have a better idea of where we're at. So, um, so let's call this thing phase one underscore check question. Mark. Okay, so so this is where we decide whether or not that the bomb is going to explode. So, as we said, it takes in um, our input string. So, arg0 is going to be our input string. That was the, the last thing pushed on the stack, so that is is the, the closest one to the return address. So, return address is going to be... Um, another question? You escaped out of the, uh, the last function and came back to this with the loop on the side. I don't have that. Which which section of code are you in right now? Um, so in phase one, I have you name a function phase one check. Yes. Right. I'm in that function right now. So we we started off here with phase one. Mm -hmm. Right. We clicked that. We got to here. We called that phase one check. Double click phase one check. Okay. That's good. Ah. Gotcha. Okay. Sorry about that. That's right. Okay. So. So when we, when we come into our function here, um, th these numbers are based on EVP, the base pointer. Okay. Um, so it factors in this push instruction. So this push, after that push, that is going to be zero according to these numbers here. Okay. So that that is where ESP steps out. Then um, you've got EVP on the stack, then you've got the return address. So EVP is at zero. Then we've got the return address at four, and then eight is our first argument. Okay. As it said, arg zero. That that was the last thing that was pushed on the stack before we entered this function. And now we've got we know that was our input string, and the other one was the so if we click on arc4, press n, I'm going to call that public string. That was the, our public speaking is easy. Now this makes me wonder, what if I just entered that string? This, is, this looks like, you know, it's a little complicated. It's going to take me a little time to understand what it does. So maybe I don't want to, maybe the first thing I want to do is just try this out. So if you hit the escape key, come back to phase one. I can copy this string out of, out of here. So I have put some of these nice little comments that contain at least a portion, in this case, maybe the, the full string. Um, so Click and drag over that, select the whole thing, and hit Control C to copy. Find your command prompt, run bomb.exe, and if you right click, you get paste option. Phase one diffused. How about the next one? So, what what do you guys think that function is that we're looking at? String of error. String of error. Okay. Strcmp. Strcmp. And because that name is frequently used, um, because that there might be a collision with strcmp, yeah. we're going to actually give it a different name. So, once again, we're not absolutely certain. We know that at least it compares. Uh, public speaking is very easy with itself and returns 
and, and that comes up with a success, right? Um, but we aren't absolutely certain that it's, that it's uh, the string compare. So I'll call it string underscore compare question mark. Now the fact of the matter is it actually is string compare. Or it is somebody's version of string compare. Um, but coming into this without fully analyzing it, I don't know that. So the question mark just gives me an indicator that I haven't fully understood the thing, but I have an idea of what it is. Okay. So with that in mind, um, I think we can move on the face two. So we we've been able to get past phase one. Um, we we've got some information into our database already. Um, string compare might be used again. It might be that every one of these does a string comparison. Okay. So if that's the case, we'll find out later on down the road. We're going to see this. So this is the value of naming your functions that later on you can say, well, I know what this does. Um, if you don't name it and you're just trying to keep these numbers, these addresses in your head, you know, you can, this thing is not going to be really too useful to you. So always name your functions as you can. So I feel like I've done enough here. I've gotten past the phase. That was the goal. So let's move on to the next one. So if you can't just hit escape to get back to the main function where you see this call to phase one, if you can't do that, then uh, hit G and type in underscore main, or if you've renamed it like I have to just main, uh, jump back, jump to main. So G will jump. I know it's a funny spelling of jump, G U M P. All right. So after phase one, the next thing that happens is we've got this call that happens over and over again. Then we've got our input function occurs after that. Um, so either input for phase two occurs inside this function, or this function is may, may, maybe or maybe not relevant to phase two. So I can drill into it. And we can see Curses, you found the secret phase in, in this function here. So this looks like in the flow of things, maybe this is phase two. Well, we see the, the the input string or the output string down here. That's number two. Happened just after. Um, another call to this function. So whatever this is, it, it keeps getting called. Um, it's probably not space, phase specific. So I'm going to go ahead and go with this function here, 4011B0, which is only called once. And I can check that again by clicking on the function, pressing the X key. And I wish it would save the size of this window. And you see it's only called once. So now I can do this throughout the throughout our, our main function here. This one we, we know it has something to do with the secret phase. So that one that's repeated over and over again with four zero one one uh, sorry four zero one nine nine zero that that function is called over and over again. We know it has something to do with the secret phase at least if we trust the strings. Um, and so at some point you might want to go through here and label the rest of these functions here. But let's find out if this is true. Is this really the phase two check? So the first thing I'm going to do is, and you don't have to follow along with me here, but I'll just demonstrate. Oops. Let's try. Public speaking is very easy. 
Well, they didn't make it that easy for us. Not the same thing twice. So what happens next? So everybody in phase two? All right. This is where you guys are going to take off and do things on your own. But first, I want to discuss a little bit about what you're going to see. So one of the things you're going to see is a typical for loop structure. All right. I've showed you loops. I showed you the, the, the dark blue lines that connect, connect things from the bottom to the top. Um, you're, you're going to see that in this function. Um, you can see it right here in our graph overview. Um, every for loop has, has three parts to it, initialization, counter, and check. Okay. So in this case, um, i is set to 0. And then we increment it by 1 every time in the loop. And when we hit 256, when i is 256, then we're going to leave the loop. So what does that look like in assembly? Well, in this case here, we've got 1 being moved into uh, into this bar for this is actually from the, uh, from our function, and then we got this test and uh, oh, I grabbed the wrong copy. Sorry about this. This is not the test expression. I'll show you that. Show you that in item. Uh, and then this last thing is the counter. We've got our bar for which we're mentioning over and over again here, moving that into EDX, adding one, and then moving that into, back into bar four. So uh, that was kind of like what we had done with our string array before. Um, so if we look in this function, see this right here. So we got bar four. By clicking that, we can see all the places it's used. Um, Right here, it's used. Um, it's stored in the ECX. That's multiplied by four. Um, this is common array access. So that's one of our next topics. Um, but you'll, you'll see bar four is actually compared to six. So something to do with six for our next. Uh, for, for this phase two, there's something something important about six. So uh, that breaks us out of our loop. That brings us to this side of the loop. So you can see if you, you trace it, come down these red branches here, come down the green one past the bomb explode, and then it brings us back to the top of the loop. Whereas this white block here, if, if this comparison with six works, then we, we leave the function. So that's that is the last part of the loop. That's the that's the check. Okay. Um, so you'll you'll also see array access. So in this case here, um, we've got arc four is the base. So this is one way of accessing an array. You, will, you won't always see it this way. Um, it's actually different in this function that we'll be looking at here. Um, but this is this is an alternate way of, of accessing array. So we get the base address. We increment EAX by 14. Now EAX is um, is moved uh, 14 bytes into the array, and then then there would be some sort of, uh, typically you'd see some sort of multiplier. Um, I'll have to update your, your wiki. I think I have the wrong version. OK. And then you're going to see multivariable argument functions. OK. So uh, scan app, 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 app,
usually you, you expect the same number of arguments to be passed to a function every time, okay? But you might have a situation where um, uh, it depends on um, it, it depends on um, some some sort of context of the application. So um, so if you highlight highlight the push instructions, um, you are uh, you might see some sort of array. Okay, so some array is passed. And maybe that array is dynamic, right? Um, so you may not always get the same number of arguments because. Uh, so if you want to pass men, a varying length of arguments, you might get pass in this array, and some uh, the, your next argument will be some sort of a uh, account. Like I'm passing you six items. So that's a variable uh, length, uh, variable argument functions. And then what you're going to actually see in this guy here is multiple, multiple argument functions, and in that case, um, you you can highlight the push and you'll see all the, uh, you, sorry, you highlight push before a call, and you'll see all the different variables that are pushed on the stack. So in this case, we see one two items pushed on before this call. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and let you work on phase two. Um, we're trying to figure out how do we how do we bypass the bomb explode function. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to ask me. I'll give you let's say we'll start out with ten minutes and we'll see where where everything's at.